<clears throat> All right, uh, it's 11, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, on Wednesday, it was, we talked about uh, force response to the signing total inputs, worked our way through to developing phasor relationships for uh, current voltage in a resistor, capacitor, and inductor, define impedance. So let's go ahead and move along today to steady state sinusoidal circuit analysis. Let's see what's going on in the chat. All right, thank you. I forgot my TI. All right. Okay. So let's say uh, this is supposed to be a review of what you guys covered uh, in circuit four. Uh, that being said, I understand that it might not be so much of a review to some of you. Um, so we're just going to kind of get our feet wet and just work some problems until things start clicking. Um, so for our first problem, let's consider the following circuit. I'm going to call this guy VS1 of T. We have a 2 ohm resistor here. A 0 0.1 Henry inductor here. This is our goal to solve for this voltage VA of T as a function of time. So let's call this guy um, 10 millifarads. This guy will be, oh, sorry, that should be an inductor. Um, ba, ba, ba. 50 millihenries. Let's call this guy VS2 of T. Then we have down here 5 ohm resistor and a 5 millifarad capacitor. So let me ask you guys what I hope to be, oh, and let me define some voltages here. I guess that might be helpful. Let's say that VS1 of T is 60 cosine 50T plus 20 degrees volts and VS2 T is equal to 100 cosine 50t. All right. So we have a circuit here represented entirely in the time domain. We have time domain signals. We have a 60 cosine 50t plus 20 degrees time domain signal for VS1. We have a 100 cosine 50t time domain signal for VS2. We are trying to find a time domain signal VA of T. So my first question for you guys is, are we going to analyze this circuit in the time domain? Heck no, that is the correct response, okay? We saw on Wednesday that analyzing circuits in the time domain, even containing two simple elements, was a huge pain in the butt. So instead, we are gonna analyze this guy fully in the frequency domain. So we are going to first step, develop phasor relationships for our voltages. Um, well, I guess just our voltages because we don't have any listed currents or anything right now. So how do I convert my time domain voltage VS1 into a phasor voltage VS1? 
60 angle 20 degrees volts. Right. So the only information we're carrying along with us is our magnitude and our phase angle. So that's going to be 60 angle 20 degrees. What about for VS2? Somebody else tell me what's what for that. What's our phase of representation of our time domain voltage VS2? 100 angle zero. Just um, to test your acumen, what if this were instead of 100 cosine 50T, what if we had listed it as 100 sine 50T? What would we need to do? Subtract 90 degrees. Okay, great. So you guys are all paying attention and all that kind of good stuff. All right, so we've converted our voltage sources over to the frequency domain. How do we go about converting all of our circuit elements over to the frequency domain? That's going to involve using the impedance relationships that we developed at the end of last class, right? So let's start with something easy. The impedance of our two ohm resistor is going to be what? Two ohms, okay? And similarly, the impedance of our five ohm resistor should just be five ohms. Nothing wild or crazy there. All right. Now let's look at our inductors. Um, let's do the 0 0.1 Henry guy first. All right. So what do I do to get the impedance of an inductor? J times omega times L. All right. So we're going to have a J. What's omega? 50 radians per second. And L in this case is 0 0.1 Henry, where a Henry is a volt second per amp, which is why this is going to give us J5 ohms of impedance. So the impedance of a excuse me, an inductor has units of ohms, just like resistors do. We'll see that the impedance of capacitors also have units of ohms, just like resistors, which means in the frequency domain, we no longer have to worry about those hippie relationships of capacitors in parallel, add like resistors in series and all that kind of crap. Everything gets treated as if it were a resistor. Okay. Um, so what about our 50 millihenry inductor? What's our, what should our impedance be there? You're thinking about it much too hard. 0 0.1 Henry's is what? 100 millihenry's, right? So if the impedance of a 100 millihenry inductor is J5 ohms, the impedance of an inductor half as large should be half as big. So Z, oops. Um, 50 millihenry is going to be J 2.5. Okay. Don't even need to use the equation again. We can just logically think our way through this. Um, all right. Let's look at our 10 millifarad capacitor. So I'm going to have negative J divided by omega C, where omega is 50 per second and C is 0 0.01, um, and that would be amp seconds per volt. So we have minus J divided by 0.5, is that right? If I multiply those two numbers together, it looks to me like minus J two ohms. If you got a calculator, feel free to make sure I'm not doing any of the mental math in my head incorrectly. It's going to happen. Yep, I was right. So, with that in mind, what is the impedance? of our five millifarad capacitor. 
Right. So since it has half the capacitance, it should have double the impedance because of the inverse relationship between impedance and frequency for capacitors. So this will be minus J for ohms. And from this, we can uh, now we have enough information to fully reconstruct our time domain circuit in the frequency domain. So I'm going to go ahead and take a moment to do that. So we're going to have a voltage source that is 60 angles, uh, excuse me, 60 angle 20 degrees. Volts here. Then I have, let's see, a two ohm resistor. I have a minus J two ohm capacitor. I have a J two point five ohm inductor. Here's one hundred angle zero degrees volts down here. I have a J five ohm inductor in series with a five ohm resistor in series with a minus J four ohm capacitor. And I'm looking for this voltage plus VA, and now it's gonna be a phasor voltage, right? Okay. So we have now converted our circuit into the time domain, or excuse me, the frequency domain. How do we analyze this? What can we do? Our ultimate goal is to find that voltage, VA. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that we could go about approaching this, okay? Um, the, the short answer for how we work circuits in the frequency domain, I feel like it, whatever makes us the most comfortable. Um, I would tend to avoid using nodal and mesh analysis. Um, the reason why I say that is because your calculators aren't capable of doing uh, or solving systems of equations that involve complex numbers. Um, that being said, in your homeworks where you can use computers and all that kind of jazz, go nuts. Just make sure that you can do some of them by hand because when you take your tests, you'll have to do them by hand. Um, so how we can approach this is really up to us. Um, so I have two, two thoughts, okay? Um, we could definitely combine some impedances. So, so for instance, a negative J2 ohm capacitor in series with a positive J2.5 ohm inductor. So I could switch those guys together and make it look like a just uh, J 0 0.5 ohm impedance. I could squish these guys together to make them look like a five minus J four ohm impedance. Um, but I don't know really how much all of that is going to wind up helping. So when I see a circuit specifically like this one, my mind jumps to two possibilities. Okay. The first possibility is using good old Kirchhoff's voltage law and finding the current around this single loop circuit. Uh, and then I can use Ohm's law effectively to find that voltage drop, right? Because once I know the current, I know that VA is going to be equal to this voltage drop plus this voltage drop plus this voltage drop plus this voltage drop plus this voltage drop. Or I could do KVL around the other side as well and get it. So 
That's one possibility. The second possibility, and the one that I probably like more, but you probably like less, would be to do voltage division. So I can use superposition and then do voltage division to find out what this voltage is pretty easily. I'll never have to figure out what the current is or anything like that. I can solve it directly using just the information that I have provided. So which of those two methods floats your boat the most? Voltage division. All right, so we're gonna get a little bit of practice with superposition. So um, with VS1 on, and VS2 off, my voltage VA is going to be equal to what? Can anybody tell me what my voltage division equation should be here for? And I'm gonna call this guy VA prime. So remember that we've turned this guy off, so it's shorted out. So with this guy shorted out, VA is just the voltage drop over this guy in series with this guy in series with this guy in series with this guy, which is just a portion of the total series resistance seen by our 60 angle 20 degrees voltage source. So to me, this looks like I'm going to have 60 angle 20 degrees volts multiplied by a fraction. The denominator of this fraction is the total series resistance seen by the voltage source. So I'm going to be a little bit lazy here. I see two ohms in series with five ohms. So I'm going to call that seven ohms. So seven plus, and it might turn out to be a minus in a second. I have negative J2 in series with positive J2.5. So that looks like 0 0.5 minus 4 uh, gives me negative 3.5 plus 5 gives me positive 1.5. So plus J 1.5 ohms. I did that right. That's just adding up all of those things in series. And in my numerator, I'm only going to consider this capacitor, this inductor, this capacitor, and this resistor, because that's the only thing I'm wanting the voltage drop over. Um, and so let's see, that's 0 0.5 minus J4 is minus 3.5, so 5 minus J3.5. And let me throw this into the calculator and see what we get. Five minus three point five over seven plus one point five. You'll have to bear with me because I left both of my TI calculators upstairs apparently. So this looks like it's going to be fifty one point one five three with an angle of negative 27.087. So the two and the five is what gives me, uh, the two ohm resistor and the five ohm resistor is what gives me the seven minus two plus 2.5 is positive 0.5 minus four is minus 3.5 plus five is positive 1.5. So yeah, just the total series resistance. Everybody else get this or something similar when they put it into their calculators? So this form is contingent on you putting it into your calculator and getting the answer in polar form, right? Some of you may have your calculator set up for rectangular form, which would be why you're getting a slightly different answer. So let me just see. In rectangular form, if you prefer that, 
this is going to look like 45.542 minus J 23.292. If you didn't get either of those, we have a little bit of a problem. Either you're correct or I'm correct. And I'm going to put money on me being correct on this one. Later on, that's, that's off the table. But right now, I feel strongly that I pushed the numbers in my calculator correctly. All right. So if we are in an accord, that VA with the 100 angle zero volt source turned off is this. What do we do next? Okay. So with VS1 off, and VS2 on let's call this guy va double prime i can do voltage division again right so i have my 100 angle zero source on the 60 angle 20 source off and so va double prime then is just going to be the voltage drop over the two ohm in series with the j5 ohm right so that means that i'm going to have 100 angle zero degrees times two plus J5. What goes in my denominator here? Yeah, the same thing as before, because it doesn't matter which voltage source we're looking at it, everything is connected in series. So it's gonna see the exact same equivalent series impedance. So seven plus J 1.5. All right, so that means I have 100 multiplied by 2 plus 5i. Oh, did too many i's. 7 plus 1.5i. Seventy five point two two three. Uh, sorry, angle fifty six point one oh four degrees volts, or in rectangular form. You dumb fractions. 41.951 plus J62.439 or 39 volts. And from this, my phasor voltage VA, which is VA prime plus VA double prime using the additivity uh, property of addition. And so when I add these two numbers together, I get 95.812, excuse me, uh, 852, 95.852 angle 24.105. Or in rectangular form, eighty-seven point four nine three plus J thirty-nine point one four seven. Am I done? What uh, What else do I need to do? Exactly right. So way up here, we are asked to find the time domain signal VA as a function of time. We have our frequency domain representation. How do we convert it 
back to the time domain. All right, so 95.852. Okay, where omega was. All right, so omega T plus our phase angle, 24.105 degrees. Volts. What if we wanted it as the sum of two sinusoids? So cosine omega T plus sine omega T, no phase angles. This guy minus the second. If you had known that, I bet it would have saved you a lot of headache on homework 19 way back in circuits one. Uh, the rectangular relationship gives you, uh, using the complex numbers, gives you the components of when you're decomposing it into the sum of two sinusoids, you just have to make sure to flip the sign on the imaginary part because of that cosine alpha plus beta is equal to cosine cosine minus sine sine trig identity. So three months ago, this would have saved you 25 minutes on your homework. Now it's just a oddity. I don't know. Yeah. So do we need to know like I mean it's not very complicated, but do we get to do that No, absolutely not. No. Uh, real electrical engineer, everything is in magnitude and phase angle. Yeah. That's just a if you guys would have thought about things, you could have saved yourself some trouble. Sorry. All right, so this, this problem feels pretty easy and straightforward, right? You guys open to work in a couple of more. We got, uh, let's see, it's 11.30. This, we got 45 minutes left. Let's do some other stuff. Sure. So hit shift two, and then there's a menu. Uh, three converts your answer to polar, four converts your answer to rectangular. If you're in complex mode. Yep. Are we doing example with parallel? Parallel ways. Like uh, so one of our, whenever if we do two positions, say one of our uh, voltage sources is in series with everything and the other one is in some form of parallel. So, okay, okay, I think I understand what you're saying. So let me, let me draw another circuit. This one we're going to start out with in the time domain, or excuse me, in the frequency domain. If it's not what you're looking for, tell me and we'll make adjustments. And in this guy, let's try to find this current, which I'm just going to call IX. Will this, this one do what you're talking about? Okay. So 
this problem, there is also a multitude of different ways to work it. This is another one where it could be worked using superposition. Um, I would argue that we could do it with source transformation as well pretty easily. Uh, we could do it using uh, Thevenin analysis or Norton analysis as well. Uh, I am absolutely open to doing one or all of those ways. We could also obviously do Nolan mesh, but that's going to set us up with a system of equations we can't solve without a computer, which is why I would prefer to not do those. So somebody tell me how we want to approach this guy. Source transformation. Okay. All right, so source transformation requires me to have either a voltage source in series with a resistance, which I obviously do not have, or I certainly hope it's obvious to you guys at this point. If it's not, you need to review some stuff, or a current source in parallel with an impedance, which I do have, right? So I'm going to perform a source transformation on my two angle zero degrees current source because it is in parallel uh, with an impedance of one plus J one, right? So if I do that source transformation, I am going to have, um, let's see, this is going to be two times one plus J one and the units on it are going to be volts because it's amps times ohms. That is going to be in series with, I guess I shouldn't draw that as a resistor because it's no longer a resistor. I'm just going to draw a box for a generic impedance having a value of one plus J one ohms. I now have my six angle zero degrees volt source. Here's my one ohm resistor. Here's my quantity IX that I want. And over here, just to simplify things, a smidge. I'm gonna combine these two guys into a one minus J1 ohm impedance. So what could I do next? Combine my voltage sources together, okay. So if I combine those together, that's just gonna look like this, All right? What can I do now? Okay, so I can combine these, I can do, all right, so the suggestion is if I combine these two impedances on the right hand side in parallel together, I can then do voltage division to find the voltage drop and then divide that voltage drop by the equivalent impedance, giving me the current Excuse me, no, the voltage drop, not by the equivalent impedance, just by one, a one ohm resistance to get the current flowing through there. Absolutely correct. That is one way that we could approach this. Okay. Um, but we did voltage division a minute ago, so I want to do something else. And I think the what I want to do will help this gentleman. Uh, Logan, is that right? Yeah, I remembered somebody's name. One student down, 20 to go, and we're seven weeks in. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another source transformation. The reason I'm going to do another source transformation is that um, if I can transform that voltage source into a current source, I can then do current division and solve for the current flowing through that branch directly, right? So my source transformation, I'm going to have to give myself some room to do this. I'm going to have a current source direction up and it's gonna have a value of six plus two times one plus J one, all divided by one plus J one, overall units of volts. Everybody okay with what I did there? All right, just bookkeeping. Then I have one plus J one here.
one ohm here, and this is my current IX I'm trying to find. And then way over here, one minus J1. Using current division, I can say that IX is going to be my source current. So that's six plus two times one plus J1 divided by one plus J1 amps. And then we have a current division relationship. Anybody remember what that is? Now pay attention here because we have three parallel branches. So that tells us that we have to use a specific form of the current division relationship, which you guys may or may not have been taught, because I don't know what Davis does or what Lewis did. So when you have n number of branches in parallel, you can perform current division by multiplying your source current by the reciprocal of the resistance or impedance of the branch you want, which in this case would be the one ohm resistor. And then you divide by the sum of the reciprocals of the impedances of the other branch. So that's gonna be one over one plus J1 plus one over one plus one over one minus J1 where I've been playing fast and loose with the units and I should stop. This guy. Are you guys familiar with this method of current division? Okay, good. This is the way that I vastly prefer. I think it's your video. Oh, well, that'll do it then, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there is, uh, when you have two branches in parallel, you can do it as the branch, the, uh, the, the branch you don't want in the numerator and the sum of the branches you do want, or, and the sum of all the branches in the denominator, but it only works for two, and it gives you a weird relationship where you're you know, putting the thing you don't want in the numerator, and I don't like that at all. So this is the way that I vastly prefer doing it. All right, so um, so now I was just putting this ugly fraction thing in a calculator. So give me like three minutes. Um, so I have six plus two times one plus one I over one plus one I times one over one. I probably shouldn't have had to do that. One over one plus one I plus one plus one over one minus one I. Stack error. Don't know what that means. I had that problem before. Pretty much, you just have to try to simplify it as much as you can. Yeah, screw that. Give me two minutes. I'm going to go get my calculator that does it the way I want it to do. I'll be back in just a second. Um, I've done a problem before where I inserted a whole form instead of like four and L. It's really cool when you're taking in one twenty one plus you get a stack there. Oh yeah. Uh, like on the transfer level, like you get like add it to edges or whatever. Maybe you don't have to get like that.
So I get two point nine one five with an angle of negative thirty point nine six three degrees amps or in rectangular form, 2.5 minus J, 1.5 amps. So, that was using source transformations, a couple of them, and then current division. Now, um, the question you might ask yourself is then, what would what would have been shorter, doing uh, something else or doing this? So let's let's just look at this guy real quick. So I think your first intention was to potentially do superposition here, right? Uh, superposition with the current source off, we would have had. The one ohm resistor here in parallel with this right hand branch. And then that combination would have been in series with the one ohm resistor and the J1 ohm resistor. Um, and so finding the current through just this portion of that first branch wouldn't have been particularly difficult per se, but I honestly probably would have wound up doing a source transformation there to get that current and then just use current division to find the branch from the contribution of the current source. And it would have been faster overall to just do the source transformations and then do the current division. No, there's nothing, it's like a, a, a difference of one to two steps tops. Um, something that I think I'd like to show you guys because you're maybe less familiar with it is using Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits to simplify things, okay? So if we wanted to analyze the circuit, we know what the answer is supposed to be. We're trying to find a current. Um, okay, well, actually, yeah, either way would work. Okay, so let's find the Thevenin voltage. All right, so let's do a Thevenin method. So I'm going to take my original circuit and I'm going to pluck out this one ohm resistor, okay? Because I'm trying to find the Thevenin equivalent with respect to that one ohm resistor. So I have one ohm here, a J one ohm here, Here's my two angle zero degrees amps current source. Here's my six angle zero degrees voltage source. Then I have, let's see, that's one angle zero, or excuse me, one ohm and minus J one ohm. And this is VTAP. Right? I've taken my one ohm resistor out because that's what I'm trying to find everything with respect to, which is going to what's uh, which is what's going to allow me to calculate uh, the current flowing through that one ohm resistor later. So how might I go about solving for this voltage V7 in easily? It is the voltage drop over the one ohm in series with the negative J one ohm. You're 100% correct there. 
Source transformation is definitely one way that we could go about doing it. Um, so we could do a source, uh, a source transformation and then a voltage division, and that would get us there in two steps. We could also do superposition. Um, so we could obviously see that if we did superposition with the current source off, it's a simple voltage division relationship to get VTH with the voltage source on, current source off. And then it's just Ohm's law to get V Thevenin with um, the current source on and the voltage source off. So it's going to be two steps, either of those two ways. So you want to do superposition or source transformation. Source transformation. Okay. So source transformation. That's going to give me this voltage source. Um, so it's going to be two times one plus J one units of volts. It does it hurt anything at all for me to put my six angle zero voltage source here and then my one plus J one ohm here. Nope, they're in series, so I can mix them and match them however I want. So there. So the two isn't multiplied by the angle at all, but yeah, it would be two angle whatever it is multiplied by that impedance. You're absolutely correct. Yes. So because it's an angle zero, that's why I get to write it as just a two. But if it were two, so maybe it's better than if I wrote it like this. That makes it more obvious as to what's going on. But yes, so I'm not, I'm not arbitrarily multiplying the magnitude. I am multiplying that whole complex current by that impedance. Yeah. And then over here, I have one minus J one. So, V Thavenin is going to be just using voltage division here. I'm going to have six angle zero plus two angle zero times one plus J one ohms. So that's my total voltage. Then in my numerator, I'm going to have one minus J one. And in my denominator, I'm going to have one plus J one plus one minus J one. All right, and so that's going to in a, my denominator is just two, right? One plus one plus J one minus J one is just two. So it's going to look like uh, five minus J three, sorry, volts. Or Five point eight three one angle negative thirty point oh just negative yeah no, thirty point nine six four degrees volts. So now that I know my seven and voltage, I need to find my seven and resistance. So my seven and resistance is going to be what I see looking in through those terminals with both sources off. Um, so with my voltage source off, that's a short circuit. With my current source off, that is an open circuit. So I see one minus J1 in parallel with one plus J1. Everybody okay with that? Everybody see it. If you don't see it, that's okay. I can draw it out. But
apparently one plus J1 in parallel with one minus J1 is one. Or not. So now that I have my Thevenin equivalent circuit, what does that allow me to do? I can redraw everything, right? So that whole big ugly circuit that I started with is the exact same as this. Where, just to be clear here, everything to the left of that pair of terminals I have is my seven and equivalent circuit. And I'm just putting my one ohm resistor that I took out earlier back in. And so from this, Ix is just five minus J three volts over two ohms. Um, so that's going to be 2.5 minus J 1.5 amps, which is the exact answer we got earlier in rectangular form. We could do a Norton circuit analysis starting from the beginning or just do a source transformation here and obviously get the same thing using current division. So this really does boil down to whatever methodology you're most comfortable with is going to be the right way to do it 90-ish percent of the time, okay? Any other things that any of you guys feel that you need refreshing on? Throw some dependent sources in here and mess stuff up. What do you, what do you want to do? The next... The, the remainder of this class meeting, all 20 minutes of it, and effectively all but 20 minutes of the next class meeting is set aside for you guys to get up to speed on doing this stuff again. Can I do one with a dependent voltage source? Sure, let me find one that's not gonna be wildly difficult. Um, now, obviously we can always fall back on um, nodal and mesh if we had to. So let me find one where I think we won't have to. That one says he's nodal. All right, I found one that I don't think we will be forced to use nodal analysis on. Let's give it a whirl, Let's see what happens. This one isn't, doesn't look too crazily difficult. All right, so uh, we got the following circuit that we're gonna look at. And our goal is to figure out VY, the voltage drop over our inductor. Okay, so we got a dependent source in here. There's only one independent source, which means superposition is off the table. 
because we can't really do anything with it. Um, thoughts. Uh, in parallel with a voltage source, which means we can't do source transformation because it's a voltage source. We also shouldn't do source transformation on, so we could technically do source transformation on this dependent current source because it is in parallel with that resistor. That being said, as soon as we do that, our voltage drop VY is no longer the voltage drop over the one ohm resistor, which is what we were looking for. So that's, I would argue not to do that. Right, so in this case, nodal analysis does seem reasonable because we really only have one unknown nodal voltage, right? So let's assume that the bottom is our reference. The voltage here, at, let's call this A, is known, and the only voltage we don't know is the one at node B, which is exactly equal to VY. So is it really nodal analysis if we have one equation and one unknown? Well, I would argue, no, it's really Kirchhoff's current law, right? So applying Kirchhoff's current law, we know that uh, at node B, we are gonna have 10 angle 30 degrees volts minus EY divided by J1 ohms. Uh, sorry, that is a current flowing in plus VY divided by, what am I doing here? I'm having an aneurysm. Yeah, this should be negative J2. I apologize for that. This should be positive J1. And then here we should have two I X is equal to zero. Oh no, we have a second unknown. What do we do? How can we figure out what I X is? Yeah, so uh, 10 angle 30 over four is two and a half angle 30, right? Let me ask you guys a question. I just did that math in my head to figure out what I X is, where I just did that voltage 10 angle 30 degrees divided by four ohms, and I got two and a half angle 30. Is that correct? Yeah, because that's 10 angle 30 divided by four angle zero gives me 10 over four, which is two and a half with an angle of 30 minus zero, which is 30. So I've had some students ask me before, oh, well, why don't I divide the angle by the, the magnitude of the resistor as well? Because I'm not supposed to, is the, the short answer, right? So I'm just dividing that complex number by a constant value of four, which is why I get two and a half angle 30. Just wanted to make sure everybody was on the up and up. So uh, I have one equation, one unknown. Arguably, you could throw this into a numerical solver. Some of your calculators can do it, some of you can't. So let's just go the algebra route and figure out what's, uh, what's going on here, right? So I can say that I have negative VY over negative J2 ohms plus VY over J1. That does not look like J1 at all. is equal to negative 10 angle 30 over negative J2 ohms minus five angle 30 degrees amps. Right, so all I did was I moved my constant terms 
to the right hand side, I can see pretty easily that this negative cancels this negative, this negative cancels this negative, and so I get Vy times 1 plus J2 over 1 plus J1 is equal to Ten angle thirty degrees volts over J two ohms minus five angle thirty degrees amps. So Vy is five angle. negative 120 degrees amps minus five angle 30 degrees amps multiplied by J2 in parallel J1. So if I divide both sides by one over J2 plus one over J1, that is the same thing as multiply or as having a one over one over J2 plus one over J1, which is by definition J2 in parallel with J1. Right. So let's throw this in the calculator and 10 divided by two is five. 30 minus 90 degrees is 30 minus hold on. 30 minus 90 is not negative 120. It's 100. Excuse me. It's six. 30 minus 90 is 60. That's what I get for doing math in my head. I told you guys I'd screw it up. So I'm talking about this part right here. I'm saying 10, over, or 10 angle 30 divided by 2 angle 90. And I had 30 minus 90 as negative 120 when it should have been 30 minus 90 is equal to negative 60 because that's how math works. Five angle minus sixty minus five angle positive thirty, and then I have two I times one I over 2i plus 1i, which is just 3i. X times y. Four point seven one four angle negative 15 degrees. Uh, again, depending on your model of calculator, you may have been able to literally stop right here, throw it in your calculator and it spit out an answer. But I know that the TIs, uh, the numerical solver doesn't like having complex numbers in it. So you would have had to go through the algebraic steps, which is why I didn't. All right, um, we got nine minutes left. We want to do something else. We want to knock off early and start again on Monday. It's up to you guys. I'm I'm at your beck and call for the next two days. Yes. So the trig identities um, for those of you who don't remember them off the top of your head. Um, Sine of x is equal to cosine of x minus 90 degrees, which means that cosine of x is equal to sine of x plus 90. You should never have to use that one, but if you wanted it, it's there. Um, negative sine of x is the same as sine 
of x plus or minus, uh, excuse me, 180 degrees, which would be the same as, let's see, sine of x plus 90. Negative cosine of x is cosine x plus or minus 180 degrees. I'm not going to bother switching it to a sine. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have identities like uh, cosine of alpha plus beta is cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta cosine alpha minus beta is cosine alpha cosine beta plus sine alpha sine beta sine alpha plus beta is sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine beta sine alpha minus beta is sine alpha cos beta minus cos alpha sine beta. Um, Euler's identity cosine x plus j sine x is equal to e to the j x. Um, we're going to use this one uh, like later on next week. Uh, cosine of angle one times cosine of angle two is one half cosine angle one. I guess it really wouldn't matter. Uh, angle one minus angle two plus one half cosine angle one plus angle two. And that's the only one we're going to use because we can get all the other ones from that one. Like if we had cosine times sine, then we could con convert the sine to a cosine function and, and use this one. If we had sine times sine, we could convert them both, et cetera. So that's the only one we'll need to use. So that's uh, all the trig you could possibly ever have to know, but the ones that are going to show up the most is this one and this one and this one. All the others you can manipulate. And these four right here are only good if you want to make yourself sick doing stuff in the time domain. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. All right, what else? Okay, so um, then when we come back on Monday, um, we'll work uh, maybe like one or two larger, uglier ones. And I'll show you guys how to set up systems of equations with complex numbers in MathCAD and all that jazz, just in case you struggled with it in circuits one so that you can, you know, have a worksheet and all that kind of stuff where it works here for circuits two. Because you're definitely going to need it for your homework and for your take home portion of your exam too. All right. Hope you guys have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.